Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 230, that's dos tres zero. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Huh? Hope you guys are well, hydrated, rested, limited up from that malarkey. I'm feeling great, if a bit um tired, um if not a bit... um. You know, just life in general is feeling a little bit confused, a little bit muggy and foggy, whatever it may be. But the great thing about podcasting, the great thing about creating, the great thing about putting your voice out there is that you get a chance to reset, start again and just keep pushing out content. Because if there's one thing I've learned over these years of ups and downs and just general, you know, um, tough moments is that the best way to get through them is just to create through them, create through the pain or your, I don't know cry into your pillow at night i don't know there's something there's something smart and funny in that kind of saying but hope you guys are well dressed hydrated and all that malarkey i've just come back from berlin as you guys can see from my little wristband there Ooh, i got a bit of a stain there but ooh, doesn't matter um as you can see my wristband over here i just got back from the Bergheim. had a bit of a good time over there went to berlin got back the other day um got a bit of jet lag but i decided to go to gym this morning i went for a, i'm gonna go for a run later on so i'm feeling nice and pumped and ready to go but yeah, um, hope you guys are good, man. It's been a long time, hasn't it? My schedule of podcasting has been a bit haphazard over the last few weeks due to just general life stuff. Um, but of course, I'm back on the wagon again. I'm not going to do that stuff that YouTubers always do where they're like, oh, guys, I love you guys so much. I miss you. I'm going to... No, I'm just going to, you know, actually speak louder than words. Put it, put your stuff into motion as with all things. Even if you're doing goals or you have plans in your life, just the, the thing that I hate the most, or most, most people do hate, is when people just keep talking endlessly about what they're going to do or what they are planning to do. Just do it, right? So today is a good idea or it's a good start to just doing those things. So hopefully you guys are good and well rested and you haven't missed me too much. But I'm back in a hot seat now. I'm going to be posting as per usual. And we're going to get back onto the train of just, you know, making sure this content is coming out when it should be. Um, since the break, so much stuff has happened life-wise, um, social media-wise, internet-wise, um, uh, socio-economic wise politics wise business wise entrepreneurship wise so much stuff that i cover on here dj news all that stuff stuff that i've missed out on i'm going to go through a whole list of stuff and get that stuff all out of the way and then we're going to keep chugging on with some new content friday the rest of the week so please excuse some of the topics i'm talking about uh old news to you or you've heard them in the past or you're a bit bored of it but you know it's all well and good hearing my podcast or my version of events because you know it's the way that i kind of see things through my own lens which hopefully makes it interesting for you viewers and some of you listeners that are tuned in at the moment so before we get into any topics i think i'm going to start off right off the top of it i'm just talking about manchester united my beloved football team i try not to speak about too much football on here because i know it sometimes you know it can be a bit of a niche audience speaking about football i've noticed over the last few years um a very very small number of my friends are into playing are into listening to football no a very small number of my friends are into going to the pub and watching a random game of football, right? I think nowadays I'm more likely to get friends to kind of gather around and watch a big game than to watch a random game during the weekend, which, you know, in the past that used to happen all the time because you just kind of doubled up as an excuse to see your friends, right? You just you just went because you went to see your friends. You didn't go because you care about the game. But now I think as the more old, the, the more we've, um, the older we've become, the more we've been, you know, moved around in different areas of the world or different areas of the country, went to different workplaces, we've been exposed to different sort of friends, different sort of social groups. They're necessarily, aren't necessarily the same people that watch football. So you get to kind of get out of your bubble a little bit, right? So um, with that being said, you don't really need to, you don't need to be, you don't need to hang out with those kind of friends anymore in order to kind of, you know, have a good time and just, you know, be on your own. So that's been quite, you know, a bit of a revelation, I think, for me in that regard. So um, it's been hard to kind of talk about it on here because, you know, there's probably not that much of an audience for it. But I think United are going through enough of an issue as it is at the moment for me to kind of, you know, put my neck out there and, you know, speak about some of the things that I think I've gone wrong in our team. And I don't think I've even put my neck out. I'm just spe- I'm just stating the obvious that other people have kind of mentioned, but I thought I'd just give my little two cents on it. So um, as you're well aware, my United are going through a very, very difficult moment at the, at the well, we're going through a difficult period um of you know form and of results since um probably since Alex Ferguson unfortunately called his time on his career we haven't seemed to we haven't seemed to be we haven't seemed to get the oh you know the we haven't seemed to get the managers right 
We don't seem to get the recruitment right. We haven't seemed to be able to do anything right outside of the commercial aspect of our club. And it's finally starting to kind of, you know, uh, rear its ugly head again. And we've finally started to kind of hit a bit of a slump where a lot of the fans, a lot of the pundits, a lot of the media are starting to realise that we're, we're in a real, real, real big mess, right? And it's been compounded, obviously, with our poor result away from home against Newcastle, a team that are suffering probably as much as us, if not worse, who are run by a very incompetent um, owner in Mike Ashley, who's kind of essentially got rid of one of their best managers they've had in the last maybe decade in Rafa Benitez in, you know, in the hopes of maybe saving money and hired Steve Bruce, who's kind of had a bit of a, you know, pretty average career as of late in the Premier League um, and he somehow managed to uh, nick a result and I wouldn't even say nick a result I think Newcastle were well deserved of the victory right I think they probably had a bit more of the brighter play they were probably a bit more inventive if not you know a bit more laborious they had players who were hungry and really wanted to show out and as you know whenever Manchester United come to town especially away from home the teams that we're facing are always really up for it because Man United is a big scalp right we're a big team we won a lot of trophies back in the day people get a lot of satisfaction out of beating us so unfortunately the players that we have now at the moment don't seem to be able to handle that kind of pressure so whenever that kind of pressure gets put on top of them and we don't score we inevitably end up losing and um, yeah, I'm just putting up here just <laughs> our past results just to kind of give you a bit of an idea of just how bad things are getting for Man United. But these are our past results, right? So from the 23rd, 22nd of September, we lost 2-0 um, to West Ham. Um, then we went to the, we played the League Cup game against Rochdale and we just, we, we drew the game 1-1 and we won on penalties only. Then we drew 1-1 against Arsenal, which was a tight game, to say the least. I think Arsenal were probably as worse, if not worse, than us in that game. But they had a Pierre uh, Emmerich Aubameyang, who happens to be probably the best striker out outside of the top three or outside of the top two, right? So I think if if Arsenal are able to finish third, it'll be because of Aubameyang and their other strikers like Lacazette. If Nicolas Pepe decides to kind of come into form, if they end up playing um, Martinelli a few times in the league, that's when that's probably why they'll finish third or fourth, right? Because they've got bare firepower in the other teams. Um, that was a pretty poor game overall in terms of quality. Then we went to play the Europa League game against Ezef Alkmaar on the very difficult difficult pitch don't get me wrong but still we were probably outplayed for large periods of that game even though we controlled the game quote unquote the whole controlling the game thing i don't really buy because you know if you're not really doing anything with the ball when you have it it's not really controlling the game the same sort of thing happened when we had van gaal as coach we had large belts we had large periods of possession we controlled the ball but we didn't really control the actual game um and then we came back of course from az alkmaar away from home against newcastle and we just essentially um cocked it up right we completely messed up the situation and now we're in a position where we're in a, a bit of a faux relegation battle we're probably not going to get relegated because you know there's no way we're going to be worse than some of the other shit teams in the league but it's just an interesting place to be in and see how far the team has fallen but it's also interesting just to view it from the outside perspective because i think i am probably one of a few or if not one of a small number of united fans out there that doesn't actually think we're as bad as the results say we are I think even with the departures of Herrera, of Fellaini, of Lukaku, of Alexis Sanchez, um, and some of the recruitment that's come in has been a bit suspect, right? I still think with an actual fit squad of 23 players, right, and an actual competent manager who can actually get the best out of them, I still think that team is more than adequate or is more than good enough, right, to nick a result or to finish in the top six or in the top four of the league. I think so. I don't think the Premier League is as good or as competitive as some people like to make it think as. I think it's maybe in the top six. There's a lot of competition there and they can kind of, you know, there's much of muchness. But I think apart from Man City and Liverpool, the rest of the league is kind of very interchangeable. There will be, you wouldn't be shocked and surprised if, you know, a big team, a quote-unquote big team happened to get relegated this season because everyone's sort of like, you know, there and thereabouts. Um, so I think if we had an actual good manager in place, we could actually do proper bits. But I think the actual thing that's wrong with our club is that throughout this whole, you know, period of, you know, failure after failure with managers, you know, with scouting, with player recruitment, the one thing that's really stuck out or that's really kind of been obvious to some of the outside people looking at it is that Man United really need a sporting director to come in, a football director, someone to come and actually orchestrate our overall long-term vision, right? Our long-term plan. Um, sporting directors and football directors in the UK were something that was resisted for a long long time right i think a lot of it came down to the whole you know working class maybe kind of uh simplistic view on football like it's not too difficult you're just kicking the ball around you know run um, fitness passion uh, man just shouting on the sidelines that kind of area of football where you know 
um, a lot of the fans were kind of, you know, wanting managers to be jumping up and down on the sidelines, wanting their players to be rushing into players and all that sort of like kick and rush football. That probably breeded a lot of the contempt that came with the whole football director, right? It was like, oh, what, what is that? What is he or she really going to do that's going to be different from what the manager can do, right? But as the football, as football has become more of a global game, especially the Premier League, it's, you know, has got a really big reach outside of the UK and loads of money being poured into it. The demands of a football club or demands of a manager are being stretched way, way too thin, right? And the club has a lot riding on it. So, you know, if you're if you get promoted to the Premier League, you get a big purse. If you get relegated, you get a big parachute payment. But there's a lot on the line for clubs to survive and to strive to survive and strive in the Premier League. Like a lot of people's futures and employment is really riding on that, right? Away from the players, some of the kind of supporting stuff, some of the people that work in the team room, the kit guy, a lot of a lot of it rides on the success of the team. So the club and the chairman or the people involved in the in the situation overall with the long term of the club can't really risk just having all the responsibility placed on the manager so that's why football directors and technical directors come in right because they're able to spec out the entire plan a kind of long-term plan of the club sometimes it's not going to work out because you know football is a fickle it's a fickle game things change very quickly but there's a blueprint in place so that even if the elements of the of the team change you can still kind of carry on in the same sort of direction right it's the same way how you know you look at clubs like barcelona you look at clubs like ajax you look at clubs like Maybe not Real Madrid, but um, you look at some of the more footballing based technical. Like maybe Arsenal is a good example. Maybe Tottenham now after Pochettino would be a good example. You're gonna see a very common pattern on the kind of managers they get in after the said managers leave or they get sacked. They won't be such a. I think we're the only team so far in the top six or in the maybe in the top leagues of the, in the Euro, in Europe so far that goes from such big swings in the managers that we hire. Right? There's no real rhyme or reason why you should go from. Moyes to Van Gaal to Van Gaal to Mourinho to Mourinho to Solskjaer they don't really there's nothing that ties them together um, in terms of philosophy and how, how they play and recruitment the approach to team building transfers nothing is there that's, that's a common theme so what ends up happening is that you end up doing what we used to do back in the day or what Chelsea even did back in the day where you end up just sacking managers starting again giving that new manager a big purse hopefully and then giving him kind of a, a year and a half window to you know to show you something and if he does reinvest it again and keep building right but of course that costs that that costs a lot of money um it's not necessarily a foolproof way and it's just not a sustainable way to kind of run a football club so a technical director was something i was been crying out away from all the you know the things that we have a problem with in united whether it's the fact that we still have ashley young playing for us the fact that phil jones got a new contract smalling got a new contract before he left the fact that we're playing half of alexis sanchez transfer alexis sanchez, alexis sanchez um, weekly wage story whilst he's at inter the fact that we let go of lukaku by bringing a replacement the fact that we let go of two international players in terms of flaney and herrera and they replace them the, all that aside the thing that I was really crying out for was a technical director because technical director would have sorted out all those issues. He would have been able to earmark, he would have been able to see the players who don't fit into our long-term objectives and not been able to offer them a contract, right? And just got them out and kind of got other players in, you've players able to replace them or whatever it may be. But the fact that we, do, we haven't got it has been something that's really baffled me over the years. And so far from Ed Woodward, we haven't heard anything that's kind of gave us the assumption that we're going to get technical director in of the director we've kind of you know they kind of keep saying they're assessing it and they're still interviewing which it doesn't make any sense how long the interviews are going to go on for but that's the one thing that's been crying out for me in terms of a, in terms of a, a solution to this issue because i think right now i think most united fans are wise enough to know that if we sack Oli on social now we can probably go out and get a better manager but i'm not necessarily confident or assured that the current regime can identify who a better manager is because I know they're going to... Nothing that we do has been cute, has been strategic, has been a bit clever. Everything has been obvious, for, even from our signings, right? Even Juan Bissaka, Fred, not Fred, um, Maguire. Um, these players, they, they're, they're the obvious choices. We don't necessarily need We don't necessarily need that. What we need is a, a vision and an idea to pluck maybe a manager who's not necessarily someone that people are familiar with maybe to kind of be able to build our long-term goal or long-term future over a number of seasons and maybe a coach that can improve the players we have at the moment because we know we have to we know we're stuck with some of those guys for the foreseeable future and then what kind of made this more evident after the back of you know poor results was this great article that came out on sky sports news just recently now um where they profiled this uh football director called lewis campos right who's worked with monaco and seville and a few other places and he's kind of jose Mourinho's kind of best friends and somebody who one of the only few people who Mourinho kind of stayed in contact with post getting fired from real madrid right that was kind of everyone said real madrid was one of the big moments that kind of changed 
Mourinho's kind of trajectory, right? Where he kind of finally maybe started to realize that maybe his shit does stink, right? And he's not necessarily the God's gift to managing and he kind of maybe started to doubt his abilities or maybe it seemed as if the game had caught up to him and he was kind of getting left behind. So in terms of his transfers and in terms of his strategy, in terms of his formations, the tactics, blah, 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 blah. But Luis Campos was one of the only people that kind of, you know, kept a good relationship, a good rapport with him. Um, which kind of maybe do you think, you know, why wouldn't they get Luis Campos in when Mourinho was around to kind of appease him and to kind of maybe settle him down a bit? We don't know. The club is a, made, made up of a mess anyway in general. But there's a really good article here on, on Sky Sports News that I'm going to read out quickly that kind of spe- any where Luis Campos essentially specifies why a football director is so important and why Man United should get one, right? Let's get one here on the screen. So basically, here's a, here's an article. It says here, why may not need a sporting director. Luis Campos on Osmarino's Old Trafford struggles. It's from the Sky Sports News website. It says here the following. Uh, Manchester United desperately need a sporting director to balance the sporting side with the economic side of the club. That is the opinion of Jose Mourinho's close friend and former colleague, Luis Campos, sporting director of French club Lille. It's been reported that United are looking for a sporting director, but are yet to make an appointment with the club 12th in the Premier League and with just one <laughs> top three finish since Ferguson left the club. So that one top three finish was when Mourinho finished second that season when he was saying it was a good result and everyone was kind of laughing at him for saying that, which, you know, in retrospect, he was, he was right. Um... Campos, who was an assistant um, to former United manager Mourinho at Old Trafford, I mean at Real Madrid, um, believes his difficulties at Old Trafford centred around the lack of support from a sporting director. In the scooter interview with Casper's News, Campos said the following, I speak to Jose every week, sometimes every day. I saw that Jose, in my opinion, had difficulties managing United because the club has another culture, which I respect, of course. If the coach is alone, he is an easy target and he needs help. Everyone needs help in football. You can't play alone. Manchester United is an amazing club with amazing history. And for people around the world, it's difficult to understand what's happened to this club. It's difficult to see this club in difficulty. But it's diff- But if, it's di- if this difficulty is arriving, it's because you have one problem. In my opinion, the problem is sensibility. It's important to work together, supporting the, with sporting with economy. If you don't put these things together, I believe you are heading for disaster. Of course. And it's exactly where we are. Um, I know very well the situation of Manchester United and other clubs. But in my opinion, everybody needs a sporting director because the coach needs time to prepare the next match and the super ego of the players too. So you need people with sensibility. If a coach is alone, it's more difficult. So essentially what he's saying is that coaches need help nowadays. So the, the era of the Arsene Wengers and the Alex Ferguson's, the kind of um, one man kind of, you know, one man kind of running machine that ran the club from top to bottom, that was able to secure sponsorship, able to lend a hand in terms of how the club, the design of the stadium looked and seating plans and the way the box, the, the VIP boxes look, um, commenting on the fucking grass all that malarkey doesn't happen anymore you need a coach that's specifically going to be a coach that's going to be able to manage that team manage his ego sort out the formation the tactics whatever it may be doing behind the scenes get that sort of done so that the sporting director can go out and identify players there's a story that i heard recently that Luis campos got awarded the most frequent flyer miles for some airline only in a year period because he'd been flying so much around the world visiting um, different clubs and watching people play personally one-on-one so imagine the kind of insights that he's kind of gleaned from doing that over a number of years and imagine that person being plugged into a club and um, specking out a long-term vision and then kind of running that against with the manager that they've got in place so that even if that manager doesn't work out you can replace him with somebody else and it still kind of keeps ticking away whereas what we have at the moment is the kind of archaic old school method where as soon as the manager leaves we're back to square one again we have to start all the way from the beginning there's no kind of rhyme or reason why we're going after said play it just doesn't make any sense um the article continues here Mm-mm. let's get up on here I do continue so there's a following a sporting director is very important of course I believe I could help Manchester United but I respect the process of the club it's very prestigious very very prestigious but in modern football you need a sporting director if you're a sporting director has sensibilities and this is Campos's, and this is a list of Campos' uh, players that he's able to like bring through right he brought through Kylian Mbappe, Nicolas Pepe, Thomas Lemaire, James Rodriguez, Anthony Martial, Benjamin Mehdi, Fabiano, Brennan, Bernardo Silva, and uh, Bakayoko. And the, the interesting thing is, especially with United, especially with the fact that, you know, Ed Woodward and the club seem so hell-bent on making sure that we are a financially profitable club and all that malarkey, is that you sometimes think, if they were if they were that worried about money, why wouldn't they want to see us play well on the pitch? Why wouldn't they want to be us to be successful? Why wouldn't they want to do everything in in up in their power to ensure that the club runs smoothly so that the money just keeps pouring in and they can and the games can keep, keep taking more money in the club? 
Why wouldn't they do that? Why would they continue doing such a haphazard approach to it and relying on just the sponsorship money and the things coming through from league finishes to kind of sustain the club? Because they could get much more money by us finishing a certain level, a certain position in the league. I think we got 83 million just for finishing, just for qualifying, just for getting to the quarterfinals of the Champions League sort of thing. That is probably more sustainable or more of a, that's probably better, a better cash grab than waiting for us to, I don't know, flukily win the Europa League or FA Cup or something. That seems makes more sense, doesn't it? And if you did something like this as well, and got sporting director in place, he could essentially bring in players for a low fee and then essentially over a long period of time, especially if they're foreign players who might have um, aspirations of playing for Barcelona, PSG, Rome, you don't have a lucky, you could then sell them on for huge, huge, huge profits down there and down the line because you don't really need to sell them because you're United, you make a lot of money. So if people do want to buy them off, you they'd have to pay over the odds for it. So by and large, that method will always give them money. But this way, how is, how is signing Smalling and Young or Jones and all these guys that matter onto extra onto long onto bonus contract going to make them any more money. It's going to cost them money because we're going to have to get rid of these players on loss. It's costing us money to keep Marcus Rojo around because he's never plays or he's not good enough for to play for us. And other clubs don't want to take him because he's on ridiculous wages at United. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sort of sense, and that's why sometimes I wonder. Everyone always says Edward was a really good commercial manager and you know he's able to like do all the good business but how really good is he really in the retrospect like how good is this guy really he's been he's been at the helm overseeing four failed managers so far and he hasn't been his job hasn't been called into question at all even once i don't understand that managers keep getting rotated players keep getting you know kicked out or booed out of the club but so far so but for so far it would have never happened to him he's been kind of left alone in that regard that's been the odd one Anyway, it continues. Uh, before the coach did everything, uh, but now the information is arriving very fast. Now the world is very different. You need to know players in every part of the world. It's important the club has one project with a sporting director. Everyone understands where they go. You need one person with sensibility for the sporting director for the sporting and the current situation. In modern football, you need both to work together. If you don't work together, it's a disaster. So you need the the economics, the business side of football, and the football on the pitch to work hand in hand. You can't just have this club, not like you know American football clubs where it's just run completely on the commercial side. They don't really give any hoot about what's going on in the field because for the most part clubs don't get relegated there's no real cost to you finishing bottom of the league or whatever but in football there is right you could essentially go down all the way down the rungs of football if you don't kind of get the things on the pitch right and as, as well as the stuff that's going on, on the commercial side of it but you know what do i know campus 55 has been a sporting director at lille since 2017 helping him to return champions league and having helped unearth some of the europe's best talent his cv is quite something he's found and sold talent in excess of 500 million Asked if he would consider being sworn to the night of uh, to Mourinho's next pro- project. He said the answer was clear. Of course, the Portuguese said uh, Mourinho is like a brother to me. I know him very well for a long time. He's a wonderful person and the best coach in the world. So of course, if he called me, I would speak. In my opinion, football needs someone like Jose. Football needs this special coach. His energy, strong personality. I believe the next work of Jose will be his top work. So again, a very good observation summation from. Um, from this guy in terms of speaking about why as a sport director is so necessary and why we should probably go out and get one. Whether or not that's going to happen is another subject for another day. I don't think it is going to happen. I don't think the club actually wants to do that. I think in general they would rather they rather just try and get it right with a manager because I think when you get sport director involved, it might necessarily undermine the power and influence someone Edward Wood has in the club, which is again is um a negative on our part in terms of fans but if we do want to get somewhere i don't think united fans should waste their time trying to throw pedals at social because you know we knew it was a dud from the beginning we were all kind of hoping it wouldn't be a dud because you know we have a sentimental place in our heart for him for what he's done for the club but we knew he was going to be a dud from his cv he's he's shown nothing so far that's proved us otherwise apart from that little short run when he came with interim boss he got given a permanent job way too hastily in my opinion and now we're kind of reaping the bet with the reaping the rewards of it but i think long term wise what we do need is a strong um character to come in as sporting director as technical director to kind of steer that ship take responsibility of the football side of things away from ed woodward push him outside of the room and let the football people do the football things and then slowly but surely you'll see us return back to the top and i don't think we'll take that long honestly i don't think the club or the team is as bad as some people make it out to be. I think the squad, especially with some of the players that Solskjaer has let go and some players he's moved on, I think those players are okay to finish in about the top four, top three maybe, at a push. So if you get a technical director in and a competent manager 
and you have some good signings in the process of a couple of seasons you could slowly see us creeping up the league very very easily i don't think the league is as good as people make out as it is going to be but again these are all topics that i hope will get sorted in the next couple of weeks we've got an international break coming up now maybe the bit of a breather the club will um, rectify the situation i know for sure if if you know we end up losing heavily to liverpool that Solskjaer will probably end up losing his job that's that's that goes without saying because i, I just don't think Edward's going to be able to handle that kind of pressure being heaped on him. Um, and looking at the fixtures now, we have... Who do we have? We have Liverpool next, right? Liverpool next. We have Liverpool next. Partizan Belgrade away from home, Europa League. Then Norwich away from home. Then Chelsea away from home. We have four away... F- we have basically four away from home games. We're playing away four times in the league. That is insane. Wow. Wow, or well, four times, two times away from home, two times in the cup. Insane. So, I don't really see us getting good results from that from that situation. So, it's probably not going to end well for us. But, you know, what can you do? What can you do? Bloody hell. Talking about Maynard just makes you sad, isn't it? Just whenever I talk about United, I just feel sad. That's the funny I do. I just feel sad, 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 sad. But, you know, that is the nature of being a sporting fan. And I think. I mentioned it prior before, but I do kind of feel sometimes a little bit. There is a part of me that's kind of happy that we're going through this bad time because we we got rid of all the silly glory hunter fans, right? That was probably the annoying part of being a United fan where we were winning everything. Probably City are probably suffering from the same things. All your Wally fans come out once you're doing well, right? All the worst fans you don't really want to be associated with are the ones kind of speaking up and talking. So once you're not successful, those fans who are only there for the good times tend to kind of, you know, hide or turn. T- 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 tend to refrain from talking too too much in public um but i don't know if i wanted this to last as long as i wanted it to, as, as this you know it's getting a little bit uncomfortable at the moment but hopefully it changes in, in the near coming in the incoming future hopefully it does but anyway let's move on man so i don't get depressed watch listening or talking about my united um let's talk about something i saw online moby's got a vegan tattoo on his neck for some reason i don't know why um no idea. I saw this on Stereo Gum. Um, maybe he's an interesting dude anyway. He's a little bit of an eccentric fellow anyway. Um, but this vegan tattoo thing is nuts. I saw this as a, I thought it was a meme at first, right? I thought it was a fake thing, but it's actually a real situation. Um, this is on Stereo Gum. Moby, check out Moby's new neck tattoo. It says vegan for life on his neck. And it looks real. Because you remember, the, the, you remember there was that girl that I spoke about previously who um, ended up doing end up getting a face tattoo of Harry Styles on her face. Remember that? Um, and then everyone's freaking out, but it ended up being a fake tattoo, ended up being a bit of a prank because she went to promote her new uh, single. And I remember going off and I was like, you know, who would do that, right? In order to promote a new single because after, especially once you, I think people, especially social media people or people online that, you know, love for the kind of viral moments. Once you feel like you've been duped, the one thing that you do do or your the one thing that your brain does is automatically kind of cancels that person and kind of completely shuts them off from your brain again. So it's a very risky maneuver to kind of, you know, do that kind of viral guerrilla marketing kind of tactic and it'd be a complete dud. You're probably better off it, there, there being some element of truth to it. You don't want it to completely be a lie. You want to have something real about the situation. But I think this looks pretty real. I'm not sure if it is. Maybe, I don't know. Again, I'm not a tattoo artist. I'm not sure if it is kind of legit. And this is, this is kind of weeks on from it actually happening. But this is a, Nick tattoo that he debuted at some sort of award ceremony. Um, it says, yeah, Moby was continued releasing music long past the moment when the general public was paying attention and <laughs> generally receives a rather muted response. But the man sure does know how to generate headlines. Uh, for no musical reason, most recently he did so with a memoir included a disputed account of his date with Natalie Portman, which is really interested. A not disputed account of his one date with pre-fame Lana Del Rey and a story about the time that he rubbed his penis on Donald Trump years after Trump entered the political realm. This press cycle said the um, cycle for the said book resulted in Moby cancelling his book tour and writing, I'm going to go away for a while. <laughs> this, honestly, sometimes I think the the social media game, the, the game of trying to be viral and the game of trying to kind of generate clicks for your or your book or your, you know, whatever stuff you're promoting is, is a very, it's a weird game to play. I don't even understand that. I think if you've got something, if you've got something interesting to say, or if you've got something cool to maybe showcase, or you've got great music, that should necessarily, that should be enough to kind of get your thing doing the rounds on social. You don't need to be kind of like you know, I don't know the the butt of controversy in order to kind of get some clicks on your item. It doesn't make sense, especially for the older artists. It just seems a bit tacky. 
and they always seem to do it in a very um heavy-handed way it doesn't it doesn't have the cuteness or the kind of light of touch that youngsters would have um when they're doing this sort of stuff right the millennials are actually growing up on the internet tend to do stuff a little bit more a little bit more cute even that girl that i mentioned that did the harry styles face title it was something that i liked but the way that she rolled it out the teaser videos the fact that she didn't tell some of her friends so you got some real reactions the fact that the title artist was involved in it everything about it was really kind of done in a very clever way but this is just like him turning up to an award ceremony with that plus on his neck is just mad isn't it um Da, da, da. Trump entered the political realm. He cancelled his book tour. He's back on Instagram today. Maybe showed off his new neck tattoo, which reads "Vegan for Life" in all caps. In the caption, he says, "I've been a vegan for almost 32 years, so getting this tattoo seemed like a pretty safe bet." Also, working for animal rights and animal liberation is my life's work. <laughs> and to start the obvious, to state the obvious, it's a double entendre. Thank you for thank you to Cat Von D for doing it. Right? Before taking it to the gram, he debuted his Moby neck tattoo of the world and his past. Saturday in Los Angeles for the Mer- for the Mercy for Animals 20- 20th anniversary gala. Again, interesting tattoo to have. I don't get it. Um, I don't think there's anything. I think he's wearing some sort of like weird um, tattoo of Ronald McDonald. I don't know what he's doing there. I don't know what that's about. But I honestly don't think there's anything in my life that I'm that obsessed about or that interested in that I would necessarily dedicate some sort of ink on my body to it towards. I think the last thing I was thinking about getting a tattoo of was you know what uh, Jocko Wilnick, the guy that writ um, um uh, Extreme Ownership and a few other books, um, he has this phrase that he kind of says a lot when people ask him questions on Twitter on social media where he just says go, G-O, G G O full stop, go. When you ask him, Oh, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, I'm thinking about doing this, I'm thinking about doing that, he'll just say go, 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 go. And I've always think it's a really good trigger for my brain to kind of have that in my mind or to have maybe his one of his phrases that, you know, discipline equals freedom, maybe have that tattooed on me, but to go far to to uh, to kind of put a tattoo on my body that kind of links up to some sort of ideological belief to that extent is not something I would ever kind of pass my brain pass you know pass any kind of thought process in my head at all I wouldn't necessarily do it and and I don't know there's something about veganism that gets people that hyped on it and I don't, again I've, I've you know I've I've had a vegan or I've um, dabbled in the whole vegan diet for a period I did it for about a month and you know I felt great I felt amazing. Um, immune system was good i slept really well i was very energized and stuff no don't get me wrong i i, I felt all the good results from it but it, it didn't it didn't do it didn't do as much for me as as much as it does for other people it didn't turn me to animal rights expert activist i wasn't going out protesting stuff and battery farming even though it's stuff that i think is you know is abhorrent and is bad for the you know for the for the future of our climate in general but there's nothing that would lend me to go to a tattoo artist and get that tattooed on my neck that is like insane level of branding but again you know, everyone's got their choices. He's an artist. You kind of want your artist to be a little bit kooky, a little bit weird, a little bit different. So it may be something that, you know, we should we should expect. But Jesus Christ, you just know for real. Like imagine he's probably he's probably a terrible conversationalist at a dinner party, right? It, everything kind of divolves into some sort of social political um, conversation, something about, you know, the climate, something about, you know, environmentalism, something. It just it's just annoying conversations. You just can't have just general chit chat. Everything's so everything's got some sort of like, you know, activism slant towards it. That's the only reason. That's the only problem I have with it in that regard. People that would do this would not aren't necessarily going to shut up about it, right? Same same thing would happen if someone got a crossfit tattoo. You know for sure anytime that you speak, anytime you go to grab a donut, they're gonna be saying something about you know what I mean there's there's always gonna be a comment that's gonna come after which is gonna be super annoying for you. But yeah, by and large not a fan um <laughs> again not for me but again he's an artist he's a bit kooky he's a bit crazy he just released a memoir that you know he decided to go nuts and start <laughs> spilling all the tea about some dates he went on but yeah interesting place interesting guy interesting thing overall vegan for life moby's got a towel on his neck with that here he is sitting next to jackie and phoenix at the gala dinner Jackin's probably thinking this guy is a fucking psycho. But Jackin's, you know, equally as a bit eccentric as he is as well. But I think Moby would be actually a good guest for Joe Rogan podcast. You know, thinking about it, I think he'd actually be a good guest for it. I think there'll be a good conversation to be had. Maybe it might get a bit too touchy because you know Joe's firmly in the whole hunting side of things, and he doesn't necessarily have. It doesn't seem like he has that much respect for vegans in that regards. Some of their arguments can be a little bit <laughs> asinine. But it'd be an interesting conversation to see them too going back and forth about the ideological beliefs because they're you know they're two rich as fuck um middle-aged white dudes who happen to kind of you know both uh, sit on different sides of the fence when it comes to um how we go about getting our food and there's a lot of there's a lot of emotion tied to those kind of things so that'll be a pretty good conversation but again um yeah moby's an interesting dude man 
He's got a tattoo on his neck. I don't know why. Um, he's a vegan, I guess. So yeah, as the comment says on here, cool. <laughs> what an absolute psycho! What an absolute psycho, man! What what an absolute psycho! I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Again, it's a weird thing to get in it. It's an interest, interesting thing to get inside your neck, like vegan for life. But hey, we all do interesting things when we're when we're really believing in some in one thing or the other. But wow, wow, wow! Let's move on. Um. What is this going to talk about? Blah, blah, blah. Wiley v. Ed Sheeran. So Wiley's got a lot of things to say about Ed Sheeran really. recently. Recently, not recently, but you know, a long, a while ago, I'll say. And some of the comments that he's made about Ed Sheeran have been, you know, there's some valid criticism in there, but I don't know, man. I'm looking at the comments that he makes. I'm just a little bit perturbed by it all. Um, it seems as if Wiley has essentially pissed off with Ed Sheeran because he feels as if Ed Sheeran owes him a verse or owes him something because he was able to give him one thing and Ed Sheeran didn't, was able to, wasn't able to reciprocate it on that regard. Um, but let's see if I can get this video up. It's a video that he basically goes at Ed Sheeran for the most part. Where is it? Da, da, da. Uh, oh, it's, it's an interview. Okay, it's an interview that he does with um, this this lady called A Dot on one BBC One Extra, and essentially. It kind of stems from Wiley feeling as if Ed Sheeran hasn't been um, receptive, recept receptive, or you know, there's you know there's a swap thing in music where you give someone a verse, they give you one a verse back. But it just seems as if Wiley's in a position where, in my opinion, I think he's he's has to maybe come to a realization that he isn't necessarily um, what do you call it? Not PG friendly, but he's not brand friendly for someone like um, Ed Sheeran, right? Ed Sheeran's probably in a far better place to probably lend a hand to Wiley than Wiley to lend a hand to him. Um, you know, because for the most part, if Ed Sheeran jumps on a Wiley track and Ed Sheeran doesn't promote it, none of Ed Sheeran's fans will ever hear it, right? That's the reason why some, I think some of the UK grime artists, some of the UK rap artists get annoyed with some of the US artists that they collaborate with because for the most part, if they collaborate with a little Baby or a Gunner or a Future or whatever and they don't promote it on their side of the pond, no one will ever find out that they did a collaboration together, right? So you have to sometimes, I think, come to realization when you're an artist or a musician. I know I have when I'm doing my DJ stuff. You have to maybe understand where you fall in the pecking order of things. And I think Wiley has kind of maybe incorrectly assumed that he falls high in the pecking order. He maybe has a bigger draw than maybe what he does have. And I think a lot of it as well isn't necessarily just that. I think there's a lot of baggage involved in it that we don't necessarily know a lot about. That we're not really privy to. Um, but yeah, it do, it does seem that a lot of it has come from that sort of like anger, that sort of frustration, and you can feel it. You can completely understand where why that would come from. Imagine being a Wiley and you supported this kind, of, this dude from the beginning, right? And you've been kind of you know supporting him, backing him, and you kind of thought he might be a culture vulture, but you're gonna stand next to him. You're gonna make sure that he kind of you know is in the right places or does the right things or is seen with the right people. You know, you're gonna kind of vouch for him, and then suddenly when it comes your turn to kind of ask for a favor back, it kind of goes all tits up, and that's essentially why. I've kind of always ascribed to the notion or to the point of view that you shouldn't really expect anything from anyone. I don't think you should expect people to reciprocate things to, well, yeah, to maybe repay a favor. I think you should just do things without expecting to get paid back. Just to do things from the bottom of your heart because you're just a nice guy or a nice girl. I think that way you'll be able to kind of navigate through life better and able to kind of withstand some of the pelters, some of the kind of arrows that will come through your heart once you're kind of going through things because. The realization that sometimes some people are going to be dicks and they won't kind of reciprocate anything back to you is something that's going to be brutal to kind of feel by and large. Um, I'll play a little bit of the interview here just because, you know, it's interesting to hear kind of Wiley um, losing his shit. But here's, 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 some, here's some of the interview I'll play now. Let's hear it. the most 
I don't necessarily have an issue that I don't think. I think this has always happened. This has always existed in music. Right? There's always been a person that the press is or the media has kind of lumped these weird titles on that don't necessarily represent the entire, um, you know, breadth of a scene, right? There's been someone they've picked out who's kind of been the most corny. When there was a time period that people were very against the whole fact that Storm was being, um, you know, thrust upon the, the front of the queue has been kind of the, the kind of go-to grime guy. Now he's kind of, you know, it, the narrative has kind of changed around Stormzy over the last, last couple of years and that. But that was a that was a conversation too that happened quite recently. So I think that's always kind of happened. I think the, the success of the scene so far that I've kind of noticed from the outside looking in has been that so far no one's necessarily been chasing this um, commercial or mainstream uh, appeal people have been really appealing to their base which has been awesome you see people even like the, the young ads and all those kind of dudes coming up even m honcho they've been specifically just directing all their attention to the people that actually like them or that actually follow their music not caring anything about people that don't fall outside that re remit and then what ends up happening is that you end up seeing when you go on social media or you end up seeing when they repost people that have been posting their st songs or things that they like about their album you go in their profile pictures and you see that these are kids that not necessarily aren't necessarily from urban areas aren't necessarily from ghettos aren't necessarily from the road they're kids that are from outside of big metropolitan cities who are kind of identifying with music because it's something that they can identify because it's something from the uk and it's something cool and it's interesting and of course, if you're a kid from the suburbs, the one thing that you're going to be interested in is a thing that doesn't necessarily talk to you at all, right? Because you, you want to be part of that core thing. But the moment it becomes mainstream, the moment it becomes pop, the moment your grime artist is standing next to Harry Styles at an award ceremony is a moment you've kind of, your artistry or the um, the thing that makes it interesting has kind of lost its kind of sheen, right? And that's not to say Harry Styles isn't interesting, but he occupies a different sort of level, a different sort of playing field. And what you want from the scene overall is that for the most of the core of the scene is to only appeal to their main bases. And so that's what most people are doing. So I think for Wiley, I think he's in a position where, personally, maybe speaking from the outside, he's probably at a situation where he's kind of bemoaning the fact that he's so influential. He's such a big force in the industry, such a big force in the scene from inspiration from artists and what he's done in terms of just just everything in general. Right? I'm sure most people would say they are inspired by what Wiley has done in the past, what he's done nowadays. But he doesn't necessarily see in that being replicated or being respected in the commercial side of things. He, he's, his influence isn't as far reaching as it should be. His success isn't as big as it should be. And that kind of would make you feel a bit resentful. But to kind of label Ed Sheeran and Drake a culture vulture, I don't necessarily think it's true. I don't, I, I think for as much as people like to say Ed Sheeran might be a culture vulture, I don't think he really has that much to gain out of associating himself with grime, associating himself with people from the road. I think they had those artists have more to gain by having him next to by having Ed Sheeran next to them as opposed to the other way around um, I think with Drake's the same thing was going on there too I think of course Drake has been maybe strategically clever in terms of positioning himself as the kind of de facto guy that is really into music and supporting people right I saw him recently on the stage recently just on the side of a stage um, you know vibing out to Lil Keed when he's performing at some show somewhere he went and went, he went to see Post Malone perform at his Toronto show he's, a, he's generally a fan of music he'll go and see people perform right he reached out to artists recently just reached out to Summer Walker and said he really liked her new album so I think maybe he has been clever in that regard but I do I do think um, over the years I think Drake has demonstrated and proved that he's actually about this for real he actually doesn't necessarily need to fly out however many miles it is to come to the UK to help um, you know, revive uh, the top boy production to come to the press. You know, this there's, there's things that American artists used to say they would do back in the day that they'll never do, right? I don't know. Some a big artist would have probably said they would have invested into Top Boy, but it wouldn't have appeared at the press conference at the sorry at the um, at the premiere, right? They might have probably skyped in. There's little things that US artists used to do that they used to kind of think the UK they used to regard the UK as an afterthought. But Drake kind of serves as his primary goal, right? Didn't he turn up randomly at some six seven show that time, right? Or was it Boy Better No Show and just completely duppy the dance, right? And, and I, I'm sure he didn't charge those guys for it. I'm sure he just came over just for the love because he happened to be here anyway promoting an album, right? He's kind of very, he's very friends, he's very friendly with Semtex. Um, he just has a very big rapport. He kind of took that girl, is it Amy something or one of those girls that hip those hip hop DJs and took her on tour? Like that's all. That's not something that you do because you feel like it's an obligation, something that you do because you want to give those people a chance. You feel as if they are, um, you feel as if those people need to be given a bigger platform. They sh you feel as if these guys are really good and they should be, 
touching more people and you feel that the uk music has is really underrated and all this malarkey and it's influences your stuff like that's actual comes from real love so i don't think you call that culture vulture um but again i just think wiley is in a really weird position at the moment he's just you know his influence is is is, is in, immeasurable but he probably can't see it physically, right? He doesn't see it physically because he reaches out to Ed Sheeran for a collaboration and he gets aired. He reaches out to Drake for something and he gets aired. Do you know what I mean, it doesn't necessarily seem as if the influence that he thinks he has or that we know he has is being shown in kind of a tangible way. It kind of, it feels a bit, all a bit ephemeral. It's kind of, his, his influence is kind of like on the forums only. It's not necessarily happening in IRL, which again, can be distressing. But I think, you know, nowadays he just needs to appeal to his base understand the position that he plays, understand where his role is in the, in the scene and just kind of do his job. But, you know, I think by and large, this is part of Wiley's rollouts, isn't it? Calling into radio stations, shouting his head off, going crazy on Instagram Live. It's just part of his kind of makeup. And I think with the advent of social media, he's kind of, it's just kind of ramped up even more. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I don't necessarily agree. I don't think Ed or or, or or Drake is our culture vulture. I don't necessarily see that at all in, in, in my in my summation. But again, I don't have inside information. I don't know what's happening. Um, while he has got a new album coming out very, very soon. So maybe this is part of the reason why he's saying all this stuff. Um, but let's see. Let's wait and see. Wait and see what happens. Um, hopefully we get um, some music from him in the near future. And that will hopefully kind of silence um, himself or, si not silence, or silence the critics and allow him to kind of get back onto the place he wanted to be on. But I don't know, man. I don't know. I just think it's a, such a bad situation to be in for all involved. And I hope he's able to kind of realize that, you know, his influence is there, man. We all love him for what he's done. You don't need to get validation from Ed Sheeran or these kind of dudes, man. We don't need that. Or oh, you don't need that. You know what I mean? You're, you're Wiley, man. You're Wiley, bruv. How would I get this screen to come off? Ah! There we go. Boom. Okay, we're back. We are back. Okay, cool. So, um, what's next on this list here? Du, 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 du. <laughs> mm -hmm. run, what's this one? Let's next one. What's this next list here? So much to run through. Oh, Demnally's Vetemont. That's a big news, isn't it? I forgot. Did I talk about this for you? No, I didn't actually. Did I? I'm definitely I mentioned this previously. Being the biggest Vetterman fan out there and being a big Demna fan. I'm, I'm more of a big Demna fan than a big Vetterman fan. I think everything Demna does, I'm I'm really riding on that train. I'm all fucking aboard that kind of fucking hype train all over it, all over it, all over it. Um, Sad news and maybe inevitable news. I think we all kind of will. I think most fashion fans were aware that the, the whole uh, Demna at... Um, Vetterman wouldn't last as long as we kind of hoped it would last. I think it was always tended to be a kind of temporary project that he kind of did for a short period of time. And maybe all in all, it was probably a project that was only done specifically to kind of use as a bit of a, um, as a business card or as a calling card or as a flyer or the billboard to kind of get himself bigger jobs or to get himself be put in kind of different kind of conversations. And that's always a really good idea to do, isn't it? And um, part of the reason why, Virgil was able to get the Louis Vuitton job was because of all the other stuff that he'd done outside of um, Off-White, right? The kind of collaborations and all the appearances, all the interesting projects. Those were the things that kind of probably catapulted him up the name, up the list of kind of um, uh, potential replacements um, for Kim Jones when he left um, Louis Vuitton menswear. So this is always kind of, kind of, you know, a common thing that was going to happen. But again, once once it was kind of confirmed, it was still something you know, sad, a bit of an end of an era sort of thing. Um, I've got the news on here. I want to kind of quickly show you guys if I can get the screen to work. <sighs> oh, man. Come on. Show me. Where is it? There we go. Cool. All right. So is this going to work now or not? Nope, it's not going to work. So this is not to call that that's appearing here on the um, WWD magazine. Exclusive Demna um, exits Vetemar. I feel I've accomplished my mission, says a designer who co-founded co the edgy, influential brand five years ago. So this is an article here from um, the new magazine. It says the following: Demna, um, I don't pronounce his name, Vas Vasalia, Vasalia, Gas Gas I don't know, Demna. I'll just call him Demna. The Georgian designer who ignited the streetwear juggernaut in fashion is stepping down from Vetemar, the brand that sparked it and also propelled him to creative helm at Balenciaga in Paris. He says the following, Vetema has always been a collective of creative minds. We will continue to push the boundaries even further, respecting the codes and authentic values of the brand and keep on supporting honest creativity and genuine talent. Demma's brother, Guma, 
uh, Guru, I'm sorry, co-founded, um, co-founder and chief executive officer at the Zurich based fashion house said that in a statement, Demna has accomplished over the past five, over the past few years, um, represents a key chapter of the story of Etema. We are very grateful for his work. It's contributed to the momentum of the house. Both brothers declined to elaborate beyond the statement released exclusively WWE over the weekend. And it is understood Demna will continue to, in his role as creative director of Bensiago, which is scheduled to parade in spring 2020 show in Paris in 2000, in whatever just passed now. Now, while the release um, hinted at a, a additional projects, saying the designer for EA stepping down for his personal position to pursue new ventures. Demna's talent and vision of fashion have fundamental and continued success in Vetemar. He has made an outstanding contribution to the company legacy and the writing of the clothes of the brand, which obviously is important. That hoodie goes hard. You know it does. Um, for the part, for, for his part, the designer said, I started Vetemar because I was bored in fashion and against all the odds fashions. Again, uh, oh, I started Vetema because I was bored of fashion. And against all odds, did um, change once and forever since Vetema appeared. It also opened a new door for so many. I feel I've accomplished my mission of conceptualist and design innovator at this exceptional brand. And Vetema has been shorted to a company that can evolve its creative heritage into a chapter of its own, which is awesome. To be sure, but uh, Gersava brought something fresh, raw. Um, stage of Vetema's show in 2015. That's a, that's a mad run, isn't it? First show in 2015. And look how much stuff they look how much have changed the silhouettes, the you know, what goes down the runway, the approach to fashion, like just everything, the attitudes, just incredible, incredible, incredible influence. Soon his, his extra long sleeve and monster shoulders were all over the runways and and to eight hundred thousand dollar hoodies and with slogans and logos became covetable items for sneakerheads and fashionistas alike. Um What's more, Demna innovated in fashion by draining collections uh with seasonal themes, gleefully uh, openly appropriating signposts of consumers, culture, taking sociology, sociological approach to analyzing what triggers consumers um, and desire stretching the boundaries of what's considered luxurious and chic. He also upended the multiple industry conventions, staging runway shows during men's and couture fashion shows, sometimes not at all, casting unconventional models, amateurs, mostly found on Instagram, inviting ordering people with meager followings or influencers to help construct the Vetema image and teaming with an array of brands with special manufacturing expertise from Alpha Industries to for bomber jackets to juicy couture and tracksuits, right? So yeah, that made trash collection with his black fingernails and facial scruff, guys layer, and was also seen as a ringleader for all things underground and alternative, exalting the gritty elements of Paris in his collection, along with jolts of s and punk, seen in kinky boots and spiky sunglasses. While not a direct-to-consumer brand, Vetemar leveraged his power on the internet, um, particularly Instagram, which is very true, right? For all the success Vetemar had, they weren't even direct-to-consumer. You couldn't actually necessarily buy it from their own store. You had to buy it from other retailers who necessarily didn't always buy the same things um some of the clip they kind of were very picky about what certain brands could what certain what certain stores could buy from their collection it was all very closely guarded some stuff didn't even make it to production so it's very interesting in the way it kind of succeeded even though it had so many there's so many ways there's so many challenges to get hold of it with supreme at least you know even though Supreme's hard to get, you can at least go to the site and buy it if you have the time, if you have a bot, if you have the money. You can always kind of buy, get a hold of it. But for for kind of Vetema to have that level of success, having to go through kind of, you know, third party retailers, having to go through retailers who don't necessarily all buy the same things in the collection is a very, very clever thing that they've done. Very, 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 very good innovative. In 2017, uh, an interview with WWE, Demna said, or oh, Guram said, sorry, my top five e stores represent about half of my business. The dimensions of the orders and dimensions of the merchandise you can sell online is it's insane the main stores are in big cities and now there are so many people outside the main cities that are starting to be aware of fashion yeah the departure of demna raises question about how vetema will continue um so it's obvious it's a continue because it's, it's obvious i think what's going to happen i think in general um demna is probably going to follow the virgil blueprint or you know the not even the virgil blueprint, helmet line blueprint the maybe the John Galeano blueprint and the Tom Ford blueprint, all these other people blueprint where he's going to probably pull away from Vetema, do his stuff with, um, do his stuff with Balenciaga and then kind of associate his own name or maybe another studio name with his collaborations that he would do kind of personally on the side, the same way how Off-White, Virgil's kind of being, Virgil's slowly but surely turning Off-White, pulls that more into a kind of a uh, all-encompassing design studio where he can kind of, you know, f the fashion runway side of it serves as one aspect of creative output and then the stuff that he does outside of it, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the dress that he did for Hayley Bieber for their wedding, whether, whether it's the collection you do with ikea those are things that you do kind of outside of your main fashion thing so you turn your so it's it kind of reminds me of what um 
of what Undercover do, where I feel as if Undercover Lab is its own sort of studio, or maybe even what Hiroshi does at Fragment, right? My kind of main idol and the guy that I've kind of always respected in the scene, someone I've kind of went to kind of emulate, where Fragment Design is a, his design studio that he then um, associates other collaborations with or does them besides it. And then also he has the other side arm of Fragment Design where he kind of lends his own namesake to personal projects where you'll have HF time, whatever, right? And I think Demo will probably end up doing the same thing because that way he'll be able to showcase more of his talents, showcase what he's able to do, um, whether it's interior design, whether it's furniture, whether it's product design, whether it's events management, whether it's events promotion, whether it's even designing merch for bands. I can see loads of uh, avenues coming in there, right? Record label, blah, 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 opening a bar, fashion store. Those are all things that can kind of live within the kind of Demna um, sort of umbrella. And then the Balenciaga will be kind of his way of showcasing how he is able to work within the constraints of a kind of quote unquote commercial business. And in that way, if the Dem if the Balenciaga thing falls flat or if he gets bored, he has loads of potential. He has, lo he has a, a, a breadth of a portfolio to show somebody, hey, look, here's what I can do. Bang, 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 bang. And I think that's probably a really cool, interesting way to go about things. And again, um, I'm sad to see it end, but I think in general... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, even the past few seasons, Demna had not much to do with it, right? Um, it was probably something that was kind of slowly but surely being handed off to up to other people inside the design inside these whole click. Uh, but I think the way that they design the codes that are in there, the aesthetic that they use, the political aspect of it, the social dynamic of it, the social political aspect of it, um, the tones, the colors. I think it's a it's a probably an easier brand than most to kind of allow for somebody like the head man to kind of step aside from another people to kind of step in and also do well with it. i don't think it needs him to stay there i think it can it can function on its own without him um being the main figurehead but again who, who's to say he wasn't he didn't step away a long time ago he probably was way away from this scene from a time ago but i think in general it's a very clever approach i think you're going to see a lot more designers doing this kind of taking the opportunity to not just you know how there's a there's a big drive with a lot of fashion editors a lot of people in this scene who are kind of very annoyed at a lot of the younger kids that are graduating from fashion show, graduating from fashion college, weren't necessarily doing their own thing. I think the cleverer thing to do, maybe not to kind of rinse your own money, would be to kind of take a big fashion job and then on the side have your own little atelier, your own little design studio, kind of churning out cool, interesting products you just do for the love, right? You take a big salary from your big brand that you're working with and you just pump that into your kind of little side project and you use that to kind of put some interesting things out there into the, into the into you into the kind of space and hope that somebody kind of notices it and that can kind of take you onto other places, get your investment, your own brand, blah blah blah. blah. It's a very clever way to kind of do things and something I'm kind of interested to see more people do in the future but again um r.i.p um demna at vetema it was an interesting it was an interesting era a very cool era an era that i kind of obviously got involved with too let me just c make this screen go back to normal hopefully it works come on oh let's go back on here display why, why is it doing this for him huh? why are you doing this for why are you doing this for why are you doing this for recording is it recording now nope nope i'm my back Am I back? Yes, I'm back. Display, capture, no, go away. Okay, well, here's the hoodie that I have anyway. The camera's going a bit crazy with me at the moment, but you know, I've got the old old school hoodie there as well, as you can see. Yeah, yeah, the old the old OG there. Yeah, big up, big up, big up, big up, as you can see there. Boom, boom, boom. So yeah, big up, big up Demna. Uh, what you call it? That was an epic, epic time that we had together hopefully he goes on to do other bigger and brighter things in the future as you guys can see my screen is going to be haywire for some reason i'm not sure why oh there we go we're back again on the main screen but anyway so um let's go back to the one i'm not sure what's happened i tried to make this work but it's definitely not working here display capture take this off video capture there, there we go i'm back now okay so um this has been the episode of Zinger Show. I think that might be a good place to end it because it's not really allowing me to do the hotkeys at the moment. I'm not sure why. Usually you can switch between the scenes and make sure things are going your way, but it's not necessarily allowing me to do so. I don't know why this is the thing, but hey, hey, hey. Uh, one, two, one, two. Boom, it's not working. It doesn't know. Anyway, this is the Zinger Show episode number 230. I'm going to come back again on the other side with another episode. Um, so I'll see you guys then. Uh, more information regarding myself. I'm going to be DJing this Saturday, actually, at the Heathcote and Star. This Saturday, he's got stuff from 9am to 1. So if you're around and you want to hear me play some good funky tunes, I've got some good stuff in the locker that I want to play. It's been a while since I've played there, so come down. That should be a good time, good laugh. 
come on down to Heathcote and Star. More information can be found on our website, zonzinger.com. Go to DJ Gigs and you see our full list of my bookings and that malarkey. Um, you can also, if you listen to it for the first time via the podcast app, leave me a five star review. As always, that goes a long way to make sure people find out about the show. Watch it via YouTube. Give me a like, leave a comment. Let me know what you think of it. If it's your first time and you like what I've had to say, why not subscribe and tune back in again for my more updates on that malarkey. DJ mixes I have available online too. You can check out. You can check out my blog, check out my photography. All those links can be found in my description of my video here and on the audio podcast. You can check that out too. And um, until then, or until, yeah, until another time, I'll see you guys again very soon for an episode of the show. Um, hopefully very, very soon. But if not, very, very soon. Until then, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been my pleasure. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace and take care. Bye.